Hey, good morning, everybody. We're just going to uh, give you another couple minutes for a few more to log in, and we'll kick it off. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ernesto. I'm a data analyst here at Looker, focusing on the gaming industry. We're excited to present our webinar today, Level Up Your Gaming Analytics. Um, before we kick off, just a little housekeeping. Um, today's webinar is being recorded. Uh, we'll send you a copy of the recording and the slides afterwards. Um, we want this webinar to be valuable for you, so we want you to get interactive. You can ask as many questions as you want at any time using the chat screen underneath the webinar window. Uh, we are monitoring this and we'll answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A session um, that we do later. Uh, right, so let's do this. Um, I'm super excited to be joined this morning by the famous Camilo Fitzgerald. Um, Camilo was the first hire at Helsinki's Future Play Games, um, pioneers in the view-to-play category of ad-supported games. Uh, he wears many hats there. Um, today he'll be kind of wearing his uh, analytics hat. Uh, so welcome, Cam. Thanks very much uh, for joining us. You'll be hearing from him in just a few minutes. Um, we'll do a little kind of warm-up here to get us going. So. Um, Let's say last month in our mobile game, we were showing on average um, 1.7 ads per session. Uh, this month, uh, we get this KPI that we're showing 2.3 ads per session. It's gone up. Um, everybody will have some follow-up questions to this metric. One person will want to know, well, was there a new version released that maybe is um, like just interrupting the, the play more and, and uh, showing more ads. Um, or maybe people are you know, having more fun in the game and the sessions are getting longer. Or maybe we're making more money um, and it's OK that, like, uh, that we're showing more ads. Um, but is that you know, having a negative effect on retention? So that's just a small set of questions that people would have if, if that metric went up. And generally what happens is it creates a bottleneck. Uh, we're relying usually on like a small group of analysts or, you know, in a smaller studio, a single person. I suppose like um, Cam was when he was starting off at uh, Future Play. Um, this bottleneck um, means that not everybody's going to get their question answered. Maybe one or two people are going to get their questions answered and then, you know, that bottleneck or that, that analyst um, gets... Uh, gets tired of answering them. So let's try to quantify this, this problem a little bit. Um, last year, 
as an industry, we spent $4 billion um, on advertising, trying to acquire players to play our games. $4 billion. Again, different people will have different questions from marketing. Um, did the users that we bought convert? Did they actually buy anything? Uh, did they watch any ads? Uh, did they invite any other users? Everybody has a ton of questions. And really, to compound the problem, every one of those questions come from different silos of data. Um, some of those answers lie in you know, your app store. Some of the answers lie in the ad network. Some of the answers lie in uh, finance reports that you might get from um, iOS or, Andro or, or Apple. Um, uh, and other, other places will come from your like, behavioral kind of events data. And so ultimately what happens is all these people have siloed questions, and they don't get their questions answered. And what it leads to is this $4 billion mostly wasted. We, we don't have enough insight to tie our user acquisition to our monetization and our retention. And we have to make guesses about where we spend our marketing dollars. So that's, that's sort of high level uh, what we wanted to, to um, talk about. Um, in a second here, Camilo is going to walk you through uh, a little bit about Future Play, the, the company, a little bit about um, uh, how their, their process for collecting data and centralizing it, um, and a few analytics examples. After that, we're going to go through um, the Q&A session. So don't forget to go ahead and start asking questions as soon as you think of them. Uh, and after that, we'll, we'll do a brief um, demo of uh, Looker um, and uh, introduce you to, to Blocks. Um, so with that, uh, I will hand you over to Cam, um, and uh, yeah, take us away, Cam. Hey, uh, thanks for the intro, Ernesto. Uh, Cam here. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as Ernesto said, I'm an analyst at Future Play Games, and I guess the idea of this segment is to provide a. Uh, later on, Ernesto will be going through the gaming block within Looker, but this sort of provides a bit of flavor around how we've used. Uh, uh, looker within our analytics stack to achieve what we had at Future Play. Uh, first, I guess, a bit about us. So, uh, we were founded in 2015. We're a mobile games startup based out of Helsinki. I think we're actually 34 people now. We started using Looker at the beginning of 2017, just under three years ago. 100 million downloads to date, just under 20 million in revenue, and we've in order to get to that state, to pump 16 million into user acquisition. Uh, in terms of the games we've made, we started out when we were smaller building uh, idle games around, as Ernesto mentioned, primarily ad-based revenue with the view to play model, which we coined. Um, and that's done really well for us in our first couple of years. It's sort of grown us to where we are today, allowed us to achieve a place where we're sort of run rate profitable, lifetime profitable. But really for us, the next step is if we're going to sort of go from the 10 to 100K daily revenue range to the 100K plus, we've got to set our sights on the top grossing markets. I mean, it's either that or with ad-based games releasing many, many in a hyper-casual style. But for us, I think we want to release a few solid games. So we're really at a stage now where we're moving on and trying to push into the uh, IAP market. So that's a little bit about us. Uh, on to our stack. This is what our stack would kind of look like. Well, this is what our data platform would look like without the stack. And uh, as Ernesto mentioned earlier, there's a big issue with siloed data. So, you know, for example, we use uh, Firebase to collect game analytics on what players are doing to sort of understand from a product perspective what's going on. Um, we use AppFlyer as our mobile measurement partner to understand where our players are coming from and run user acquisition. Um, to date, uh, most of the part of our uh, revenue has been based on uh, rewarded video ads. So those, the information on that comes directly from the ad networks. The app stores have information on uh, you know, daily reports and IAP data, and they have uh, conversion range for the store pages and store rates. And then, of course, there's the user acquisition side of thing, where we have all our you know, networks telling us how much we've spent. And really, all this data is sort of siloed in these different places, and it presents multiple problems. 
And one is a barrier to entry for the team. So you know, all of these are tied together into one sort of living, breathing machine that's our ecosystem, but it's very hard for different members of the team to manage like, you know, 10 to 100 different logins for all these different places. And there's multiple sources of truth across them as well. Um, it becomes also very hard to manage all of these and validate the data within all of them, quite a manual process. Um, one example of validation is, you know, we, we need to check if the amount of installs the user acquisition networks are charging us for match what we're actually seeing coming into the game. And it's quite a manual process to do this unless everything's uh, consolidated. And then finally as well, uh, like business logic as well, is really hard to do in here. It's quite a manual process. Um, for example, user acquisition uh, needs to take into account the amount you're spending, the install rates you're getting, the revenue you get back both from ad networks and where the users are coming from, and then early gameplay data as well. And it kind of ties this whole picture together to understand your, your user acquisition picture. And then finally as well, it's quite hard to automate tasks with this. Um, yeah. So we built our own stacks, which uh, I think there's more and more common across different gaming companies are building stacks that look pretty similar to this. Uh, this is what ours looks like. And I'll just go through it briefly before going into some examples. Uh, so on the lower layer here, we have data collection. It's the same sort of stuff you've seen in the previous slide, but the aim here is to get everything into one data warehouse, which for us is Google BigQuery. Um, we pull uh, install uh, information from AppSplyer, so we know where our players are coming from, into BigQuery. Firebase automatically pipes events data, gameplay data into BigQuery as well, and transactional IOD data. And then for all the user acquisition networks and revenue networks and app stores, uh, all the data we have with them, we use a cool tool which I'm very happy with called Libring. Um, and they're basically one API to all them all. So they just handle plugging into all of these different networks and stores APIs, and we only need to pull once from them. Now at this point, it's great. We've got all the information we want uh, in, in BigQuery, but of course, you know, it's a sort of big soup of data and you need some way of visualizing and actioning this data. Uh, yeah, there we go. And uh, for us, when we built this out a few years back, we kind of looked across the different markets and thinking about primarily just a visualization solution. And uh, for us, we ended up going with Looker. It was sort of hands down the winner for us. Um, and we've had, you know, never looked back, no regrets at all, uh, which is, I guess is why we're happy to sort of do this talk in collaboration with them today. Um, and for us, like, the, the real crux is not only was it the best in class uh, visualization solution in our opinion, but also it goes further in terms of being able to action the data effectively and build that automation from a lot of tools they have built on top of it. Um, and I guess for the Next section, I'm just going to show some examples of the kind of things we do with Looker within our stack. So first up, uh, let's go for the topic of user acquisition. Um, I think after this segment, Ernesto will be going through uh, the gaming blocks, which will be a more sort of interactive demo of what they have built out. But for this purpose, there's just some sort of static screenshots. So if you imagine the sort of full flesh living dashboard behind this. But the, so the top part here, we have like a standard uh, ROAS view of our user acquisition ecosystem, which shows you know, quite simply on a week by week, uh, the payback window of how long it takes for the spend to return in terms of uh, IP revenue and ad revenue. But where things really start to come alive is this table here, which is sort of further down the bottom of the dashboard. Um, where in there we have per channel, so it's you know, per campaign, country, uh, network, uh, game, wherever we're putting different bits on. We can see the revenue, uh, the spend we've had, the number of installs. We have a predictive LTV model we built with Looker, So we know right from when users first come in how much they're expected to be worth. We know how much we're currently bidding on the different uh, channels on this. And from that, we can get, of course, the return on investment, the predictive return on investment per install. And using that information in that last column there, you can see there's an action we've set up, uh, which is either to increase the bid or decrease the bid. And that column actually has a, a button in it, which if you click on that action, it takes you to the place you need to go to change the bid. So this was pretty cool and allows us to sort of, you know, rather than just viewing data, create actions from it. 
Um, but this table here is actually a couple of years old already. I think as we scaled, we found quickly that a fair amount of time was going into uh, changing these bids, and we thought, you know what, why not automate this? So this was the next step towards automating these changing of bids, according to this table. If you take this very thing, we, we've built out a tool we call BidBot, an internal sort of automated user acquisition tool. Um, and what this does is it takes a very similar table, and then uh, depending on the user acquisition network we're wanting to change bids on, if they have a bidding API, like your Facebooks or Googles of the world, we have a job set up in Heroku which reads from Looker and changes those bids automatically every night. A lot of networks, uh, okay, um, sorry, just got distracted. Uh, a lot of networks don't have bidding APIs, so we can't automatically change the bids there. Um, so for these ones, what we do is, again, it's sort of a really nice feature of Looker. You can get the table and create automatically a link from it that pipes data into a G sheet. And having this ability to use G sheet as a visualization for the data in Looker uh, is pretty handy, uh, as it means the, you know, when we share this with the different account managers across different user acquisition networks, it's sort of you know, 10 plus account managers who might change every month or so. We don't need to train them up in the usage of Looker or, uh, you know, manage different logins for them. Everybody knows how to use a G sheet. So this is kind of a really neat thing for us, and it's allowed us to really scale our user acquisition and not have to worry about optimizing the bids anymore. Everything just works automatically and put focus instead on the user acquisition strategies such as creatives and targeting, etc. So that's one example. Uh, another example here is uh, our, the ad revenue side of our business, which I mentioned before. We actually built just over a year ago, um, we've, we've always had our own in-house mediation. Um, and this is the latest iteration of it a year ago called AdBot. And it basically works as, uh, you know, each network has a series of flaws. And on the clients, we um, kind of like a pseudo, pseudo bidding system, basically. On the clients, we uh, find out which is going to be the highest value ad to show from each network and uh, show the ads accordingly. And this table is sort of an overview of what's going on. Uh, so I'm going to hide the presented chat from distracting me. Okay. Um, uh, this table, yeah, it's a sort of overview of what's going on. So here, for example, we have one country, one game in the past seven days. And we can see how much, you know, how much impressions and revenue are being delivered to these different floors. Also, we can see how much we're asking for in terms of revenue per ad, ECPM, the price here from these different networks from the floors, and how much they're actually delivering. And this allows us to check over and see if a particular floor is under-delivering. Maybe we need to shift the prices around in order to spread the impressions or revenue more evenly across the floors. But again, we built this out a year ago, and quickly discovered that you know, checking this once a week or checking this every few days is time consuming, and we want to create actions out of this. So for example, another neat feature out of Looker is you, know, you don't need a data analyst to do this. Um, it's pretty easy to set up uh, email alerts based on certain trigger conditions or weekly emails um, from tables from Looker. So this, for example, is a one that's very easy to set up in five minutes. To, shows that there's inconsistencies between how much we're asking for in terms of ECPM from a network and what they're actually delivering. And it means we no longer need to go in and check these dashboards constantly. We just get told when there's an issue, so we can go in and check the setup or ask our account manager or turn off that network if it's a serious problem while it's resolved. The last example here, I guess, ties a bit to uh, the original few slides from Ernesto. This is, like I think, the most used dashboard uh, in the company. It's just a high-level overview of our game KPI. So it has in there, you know, our daily active users, pay factor, ad stats, IAP stats, retention, et cetera, et cetera. And this is just a section that has the sessions in there. Um, so for us, not only is this sort of a neat way uh, to visualize everything, there's sort of a great UX to it, um, but also the, the real crux comes with self-serve. Um, so, as, as Ernesto mentioned earlier, there's sort of a, a great ability within Looker to remove these bottlenecks and allow people to date, slice and dice data for themselves. And I'll give an example here. You know, you've got, for example, 
session length there, and it's split by game and this dashboards. But say, for example, someone from customer support is getting a lot of tickets from Brazil and is wondering whether something's up in Brazil. It's really simple for them to... Next slide. Yeah. Um, there's a little button on the session list that you can do explore from here, and it pulls up this sort of pivot view. And you can deselect that and select country instead, and then quickly see if there's any issues within a particular country. Furthermore, if this is a view they're interested in viewing quite often, rather than needing to go to a data analyst and say, hey, can you build me a dashboard? It's pretty simple to save this into your own personal dashboard. And I think 30% of the company have their own dashboards built out specifically for them that they've built, which is pretty cool. That's all you know, time saved from that bottleneck in terms of people being able to react to data themselves more quickly, and it means we didn't need to hire you know, a team of data analysts to, to service these requests. One final thing I thought I'd chuck in is the Slack bot integration, which we, we love as well. Um, one thing here is if you paste any link from Looker, Chart or Smiley Fears, which kind of gives a lot more color and flavor to the data. And then also you can schedule pushes to Slack either based on a certain uh, criteria being met. So, you know, just like the emails I showed before, those could come to Slack, which is really neat for integrating the communication that way. Or the example I've got here, I think, is schedule once a month, which shows the amount of hours each of us spend using Looker itself. So it's kind of like a meta chart, um, uh, which is just sort of a fun, a fun way of visualizing that. So yeah, that's it for me. Thanks, thanks for your time, everyone. And I guess we'll go back to Ernesto now for some questions and answers. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks for that, um, Cam. It's awesome to see uh, some of the examples you've built out. Um, that's pretty pretty impressive that like so many people have built their own dashboards. It looks like there's a few questions that have come in on uh, adoption and things like that. Uh, first, we'll go into the demonstration, then we'll go to into the uh, Q and A. Um, so, or sorry, no. First, we do the Q and A, and then the demo. Um, so, yeah, there, there's actually two questions uh, for you, Cam, uh, from the audience, specifically called out. Um, so. Uh, the first one is, how quick was the process to move everything into BigQuery, and when could you begin to look into a BI platform? So I suppose they're kind of earlier on. Um, and any advice on uh, sort of data centralization versus when to get started with a tool like Looker? Yeah, yeah. So I guess two parts to that, like one time required and the other one being uh, uh, when to do it in the growth of the company. In terms of the time required, like we, we were very surprised that it was less than we thought. You know, like we, we hadn't built out our own stack before doing this, and it was a daunting task. Um, but I think we, we came in at a good time to do this. If you look five years back, I think you need a team around it to build it over a year or something. But as I showed in the, in the stats there, we're really leveraging, um, you know, for example, Firebase to do all the event collection and piping into BigQuery. Um, so for and for us, it was really about building out the ETL and the structure for it. Um, so in terms of the time it took, uh, it was uh, myself and uh, the co-founder on the tech side of the company, and it took us uh, a month to build the thing out part time. Um, but I think a lot of that was having a deep understanding of what we wanted and needed beforehand. Um, and then the second part was in terms of when to do this stuff. I think the advice I normally give on this is sort of doing it when you feel the need is a good uh, point. Yeah, I think you sort of know the most what you're after at that point as well. So for example, in terms of you know, the silo data I had at the start, I think that's what most people will start out with. Um, our approach is really as soon as we start uh, you know, doing things that take up a lot of time and we need to automate, then we look for a solution to that. Um, so no, I'd recommend for example, like I mentioned before, like one, if, if you do get to the point where you're doing a lot of repetitive work, maybe try pulling all this stuff into a, you know, even if it's just a G sheet to begin with. And then once you find you need more capabilities, then build out a pipe to something like BigQuery. Um, and then you can even start with a visualization tool like Google Data Studio, which is free and easy to set up to kind of get the basics out to figure out what your needs are before going for something more full-powered when the need arises, like Looker. Nice one. Thanks for that, um, Cam. Uh, another one for you. Um, so out of the, I think you said 34 people that 
future play? Do you know how many would be like monthly active users of Looker? Uh, yeah, so I do know these stats, uh, 100%, and that includes wow. office management and Excel. Um, so uh, I think, for example, it might be strange to think of office manager and HR, etc., but we have financial data piped in there and monthly billing data. So like anything database, we pump into our uh, systems. Um, and then in terms of daily active, it's 33% of the company use it every day. Wow. That's really cool. That's really cool. Um, did you set up like an internal Slack channel where people kind of ask you Looker questions? Like I saw on your on your slide about um, Looker bot, um, where it sent in that uh, that stat for you know the top users for the month. How how did you like drive that culture? Yeah. Uh, so we we have a Slack channel. I think called that Slack. Um, but I think normally the questions are more topic based. So the stack is more around the, you know, the, the sausage making. Um, yeah. But we have one channel which is ads and user acquisition, uh, channels per game, and I think that's normally where the questions are. But in terms of driving the culture, I, I think the main components are, for example, doing things like pushing data to Slack. Um, and then also I've always made a concerted effort to, when a question is asked, rather than answering it, uh, going and showing people how to answer it for themselves and how to dig the data themselves from uh, Looker. So sort of being always putting in that extra effort at the beginning to sort of educate uh, pays off massively in the long run. Um, of course, there are always certain questions that, you know, you may need to create a new view or, you know, some really complex questions that will need to be answered, but you can get sort of 95% of questions to be asked, answered by the people themselves. Nice one. Um, okay, I'll, I'll try to take this next question. If you have anything to add, feel free, Cam. But um, how does tracking event data allow you to create better games? Um, I'll, I'll try to answer this first. So to me, like the, if you're tracking the event data as long as, as well as the acquisition data and the monetization data, it paints a whole picture uh, of your studio. So you, you have um, you have a marketing person that's able to answer things about user acquisition, but then later track that user down the line. You have a product manager that doesn't operate in a vacuum. They might see that people are using this feature, but maybe um, it's only people in a very particular cohort or, or a particular country. So I guess tracking event data means that you're able to answer like deeper why questions. Whereas if you only have sort of the, the user acquisition and the monetization data, you're you're just answering like the what type questions. I um, don't know if you have anything else to add. Yeah, this, to that. This, makes, yeah. this makes sense to me. I think when I joined the industry, I you know came from a, a data background and thought that you could do everything with data and answer every question about the game, etc. And uh, I think there's a misconception around that, that you know, every question can be answered about players' desires and why they drop off. But really, I think you, the, the way you phrased it as painting a picture kind of rings true with me, that um, you know, with, with each update, you can quickly find out if, like you said, the number of sessions are dropping by that first day. You can quickly identify problems. You can look at funnels. They won't tell you sort of what to do, but you know, for example, your tutorial funnel will paint a picture of the way players are playing your game. And ultimately, I think a lot of the value that comes from gameplay data is just building a better picture and understanding a kind of better gut for what's going on inside your game and allows you to make better design decisions a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Nice one. Thank you, Cam. Um, so we'll, we're going to move on to the... Um, kind of looker demo part now. Um, so let me go ahead and set up the screen share. Okay, great. Um, so you should you should be able to see um, kind of the looker application now. So this is um, uh, a typical dashboard in Looker, and I want to just talk about some of the ways that it, it promotes this idea of self-service and, and uh, de-bottlenecking 
Um, so the first thing is that this would be like uh, similar to what Cam showed, just a, a general overview um, of how uh, the company's doing. You have everything from user acquisition to retention to monetization. And every one of these metrics is just like that slide I showed at the beginning. They're, they're only going to ask additional questions, uh, especially if something looks to be out of the norm. Uh, so some of the things that people can do directly from here is, okay, I've got 117,000 daily active users. I can choose a drill down and then um, you know, I've chosen the drill down country, and it'll break down those uh, those active users by country. So that answers maybe an, an immediate type of question afterwards. Another thing for self service would be around uh, you know I'm I'm the CMO. I've I've set a budget uh, for you know any for like a quarter or something. So I might change the date range to a quarter, and then click this alert button to uh, say right, you know, I if it reaches two hundred and fifty thousand, then give me an email um, alerting me that that condition has been met. So those little things kind of keep uh, those questions away from like an analyst queue where they could be focusing on um, something else. Um, and then the next level of interactivity would be uh, very very similar to what uh, Cam showed in that we are taking. Um, Something like a, you know, w where we're buying players from, so we can see that Iron Source here for iOS, the return on ad spend is, um, you know, looking a little bit light. So being able to drill down directly on that source and saying, right, I want to look at that same view now by campaign name. Looker will kind of rewrite that query. Uh, with the exact same visualization, but now broken down to that level below. Um, and so for iOS, we can actually see, you know, there's this campaign here where we spent 9K. We got 14,000 players, um, but we were only retaining, or, you know, we're, we're only getting the payback from 66% of them. And so... It doesn't stop here. If somebody has the curiosity to say, yeah, well, you know what, that, that's a really good campaign because it's uh, K factors really high on it, or the uh, actually retention super high, or actually, you know what, 30, 30 days is not a big enough like monetization window for us to say that you know, we've, we've reached a positive return on ad spend. They can click this Explore from Here button that Cam showed in his slides, and that opens up the visualization in kind of edit mode. And as long as you've spent some time setting up a model that people can add their own bits to it. So um, the left-hand side here, we've got like a set of measures and dimensions. I want to add something like, um, you know, I, I'm curious about the like ad revenue versus in-app purchase revenue split for uh, that campaign, it adds that. It tells you how much data it's going to scan. We hit run, uh, and it will you know, modify that query um, in a matter of seconds without having to bother an analyst. So we come back, we see that those campaigns, um, like the, the in-app purchase revenue is fairly low, the ad revenue is fairly low. So we decide, you know what, it's worth killing that campaign. And again, we can tie actions to actually do it directly from here. If I want to now share this with a person from marketing or wh whoever I want to share this with, this URL already will take them into this view. Uh, there's no need to save it. Like this, this query ID is, is sort of uh, unique to the query that I've written. So let's go through another little kind of exercise. If you remember this slide uh, from the beginning, uh, ads shown per session. Was there a new version? Are the sessions getting longer? Are we making more money? Are we losing more players? I want to show you just how easy it is. If you have a, a model set up, how, how you can answer those questions yourself. So I've got this. Ads shown per session right now is 2.42. Um, so the first question was, you know, was there a new version released? Did that change with the new version? So I'll just add 
uh, I'll just search for a version on the left hand side. I have a, a game version for you know the session that was played. I hit run. Um, maybe I'll sort it by session. Maybe I'll show a column chart. Actually, we are showing considerably more ads in this new version uh, of the game. Um, this one must have been some test version. But generally, we are showing more ads per session. So that answers the, the first bit. If I show you how Looker is working in the background, there's no tricks. It's actually written a SQL query. It's getting the game version. It's summing the number of ads and dividing it by um, the number of sessions uh, to get the uh, ads shown per session. And then it's adding like a where clause to look at the last 30 days and, and looking at only one, one game. Um, so uh, additional questions were, you know, are the sessions getting longer? So on session facts, I have an average session length uh, in minutes. I add that. It tells me it's going to process 1.5 gigabytes in BigQuery. We run it. Uh, we now have the average session length. Maybe I'll change that to a table visualization. Um, People are actually playing longer on this version as well. And then there was the question about like monetization. So I have a, a average revenue per user. Um, so you get the idea is we, we can keep on adding um, anything that we want uh, to this report to where we're happy that that metric that was shown, the ads shown per session, we're happy that we understand it in the context of um, our of our specific game, of what's changed. We kind of understand all these metrics. We can actually see that um, the retention rate uh, for day one is actually even better than it was before. We see that monetization is better than it was before. So it was a, a very successful release. So again, I want to share these insights, or I want to add them to a dashboard. Looker makes it really easy. Um, and so for the last part, I just want to show you um, how LookML works. So um, let's go back to our main dashboard just for a second. So uh, I might have, you know, as an analyst, I might have been the one who developed this dashboard and, and published it for the whole company. Um, and then other people maybe took, like, uh, this dashboard and made their own versions of it. All of a sudden, uh, I realized that I've got a problem with how I'm calculating revenue. Um, I want to. I need to make a change in how revenue is calculated for all these dashboards. Um, so this is where LookML really shines. I'll go into develop mode. Uh, this is like checking out a branch of the of the model for me as an analyst to make this change. Um, I'll click on like explore from here on on revenue just to get uh, into that metric, and I'll click go to LookML. So this shows us like the measure total revenue is um, a sum of in-app revenue and ad revenue. Uh, I'll kind of follow this through. I'll click on combined revenue. It says you know sum of IAP. Let's say we want to make a change to how in-app purchase revenue is is uh, calculated. We might um, you know we can write a little SQL transformation directly in this LookML dimension. So we'll say like case when. Uh, device platform is equal to iOS, then multiply in-app revenue by 70%. Uh, you know, so take 30% off uh, for, I guess, the uh, iOS tax. And then uh, otherwise, just give us the revenue. Let's pretend that's a real, real thing. In my own development mode, uh, this is in my own branch. Everybody's still running the old version of revenue. I can go into here. I can hit run. I can look at the SQL that's being generated, and I can see that it's added like this case when statement um, in my calculation for total revenue. Uh, I, I'm pretty happy with how that looks. I go back to the dashboard. I hit run. Every single metric 
that relies on revenue is now sort of like being recalculated. So you'll see my return on ad spend's gone down because there's less revenue, average revenue per paying. User, every one of the metrics has now been adjusted in this dashboard. Uh, and the 30 others that people have made. I'm happy enough with that. I validate, I commit, and I say, you know, ads, new, revenue, calculation. That change is now uh, something that's, uh, you know, traceable in, in a Git project. It's, um, yeah, it, it works really well for change management. And I think as, you know, a studio evolves, um, definitions evolve, uh, games get added, things get added, and I think this, this workflow for maintenance, I think, makes Looker really, uh, really successful. Okay, um, so go back to the slides for just a second. Right, so a little bit about the kind of customers, uh, gaming block, and how to do a Looker trial. So we have, um, we're up to a good percentage of customers of Looker are gaming customers uh, from, especially in the last year or so, we've, we've signed on a lot of new uh, companies. We've got like huge powerhouses like King in Sweden that have, um, you know, hundreds of daily active users in Looker. We have platforms like PlayStation uh, and Unity and uh, publishers like Playstack in the UK and independent studios like Future Play. Um, there's there's all kinds of different examples. We're we're now getting a lot of customers in gaming companies that aren't that are creating services for gamers, not just for you know the the games themselves. So quite a, quite a huge ecosystem that we're seeing now. Um, as far as uh, blocks, so Looker blocks are, are building blocks. They're, they're pre-built pieces of LookML that you can leverage to accelerate your ad analytics. Uh, the idea is to really like reuse the work that others have already done rather than starting from scratch and then customizing the blocks to fit your exact specification. So the gaming block has uh, over 50 uh, KPIs specifically for gaming. So uh, things like retention, uh, monetization, um, user acquisition. A lot of what you saw in the demo is possible with the block as long as you have your data centralized first. Um, so you can um, you can just Google uh, gaming analytics block uh, looker to to go through a little bit more detail about the implementation details. Um, most recently, we've also introduced uh, a fire-based block. Um, the idea is uh, similar to the gaming block, but for Firebase directly. So if you've ever had a fire, uh, query Firebase uh, data directly, you know that you have to manually kind of do the date partitioning. Everything is nested. User properties and event properties are nested. Um, and there's nothing out of the box like sessionization. So we've, we've kind of built a, a whole package around that with a couple of example dashboards. It just, just gives you a leg up on, uh, on getting into Firebase data. So uh, finally, we, we do offer a, a free trial. Uh, we will be reaching out to you uh, today uh, for attending this webinar. If you wish to trial uh, Looker, we'd be delighted to accommodate you. Uh, if you'd like to kick off a trial today, just uh, kick, head on to our website and request a trial. Um, and finally, uh, Robbie McKiernan, along with Jordan Howard and myself, look after the Nordics for Looker. So um, Robbie's email is, is there on the screen. Um, give him an email if you want to uh, go ahead and get in touch directly. Um, so yeah, that concludes today's webinar. Thanks so much for attending. Uh, we really hope that you found this useful. Uh, thank you, Cam, for your insight um, and for uh, everything you've, you've, you've done uh, this morning. It's great to uh, have you as a presenter. Thanks uh, for having me. Good stuff. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.